before I dive in and even say anything, I want to say something. Listen, there may be some of you that are here for the first time. Maybe you have no faith. And so I want you to know over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about South Point. And so you just kind of get to kick back and watch and see how much you matter to God. You see, last week we kicked off a new series called Launching a Legacy. And Launching a Legacy is kind of something we're going to talk about the next couple of weeks. But we kind of summarized what the whole thing was. And kind of week one, we said this, listen, South Point, we have a God-given mission. And we want to be really clear about what our God-given mission was. And so we kind of say it this way here at South Point is this, is that church, the church is not a club. And last week I said this, I said, listen, if you want to kind of tip God and then kind of have it like Burger King your way, this is not the place for you. Um, church is not a club where we get to have what we want. It's not a clique. It's South Point Church. It's not a place where we get to come and be with people who look like us and talk like us and vote like us. We believe there's more to unite us in Jesus. So we're not a club. We're not a clique. It's a community. It's a community where we get to know each other. We get to get care for each other. We live life together, but we are a community on a, okay, can we try that? Can we try it one more time? It's the second service. You guys have got to sleep in a little bit and have some caffeine. So, okay, here we go. It's a community on a, we're on a rescue mission. And I just want to say something from straight up. Listen, and I mean this with the most gentle, sincere heart. Listen, if you're looking for a club or you're looking for a click, this is the wrong place because we believe God has called us to be a rescue mission. The church does not exist for itself. It exists for the world around it. And then we said this, we said, listen, um, we have some obstacles that hinder our mission. We said, listen, at our scale and our age, we are limited with our resources. At our scale and age, being totally portable limits our resources. It limits our excellence. It limits our opportunities and it limits our growth. And when I say it limits our growth, what I'm really saying is it limits the number of people that we can reach with the greatest news that there's a God who made them, a God who loves them, and that Jesus died so that we could be his friends. And then we said this, we said, listen, we have a plan to fulfill our mission to overcome those obstacles. We're going to build a permanent campus on our, our St. Andrew's Church Road property. And so that's what we covered last week. And listen, our permanent campus isn't to huddle. It's not about comfort and convenience. It's about taking opportunities, the God-given ones, so we can continue to launch. God-given change in our communities. Now, as we head into week two, you might notice something that's somewhat similar to last week. I don't know. Has anybody noticed something on the stage? Anybody notice? We have all these doors on the, anybody, raise your hand if you notice the doors on the stage. Okay. The rest of you get glasses, right? Like um, we have these doors on, that are on the stage. And matter of fact, we, they, these aren't part of like the school's play. Um, they're not just there to be there, to have something to fill your eyes. Matter of fact, the, these doors represent something really awesome that I'm excited to share with you this morning. You see, here at South Point Church, we have an amazing student ministry. And this past summer, we sent 59 students to something called Big Stuff. I'm going to put a picture up here. Big Stuff. And Big Stuff is this summer camp um, where middle school and high school students get a chance to know Jesus and follow Jesus. And we sent 59 students from between our Lusby campus and our Lowndes campus down to Big Stuff. And they had a great weekend. But during that week, from our camp to campuses, we had 13 students make first-time decisions to follow Jesus. Yes, that's worth clapping about, right? Now here's what's even, here's what's even more awesome. This is the part I can get to wave through. Those doors, if you count, there are 13 doors on the stage because each door represents one of our students who said yes to Jesus. And the reason why we picked doors on the stage it's because of something that Jesus says, and these doors symbolize what Jesus says. Matter of fact, we're going to take a look, I want to count uh, a look at the Gospel of John. And here's the words of Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in him, God who sent me, has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from to life. And you see, what happened is when our students said yes to Jesus, they opened the door, they let him into the heart, and they crossed from death to life. And eternity was forever changed as there's 13 less souls in hell and 13 extra souls that will experience eternal with their heavenly father. And these doors represent what the mission of South Point is all about. It's helping people know Jesus and follow Jesus. And today we get to do something really special. I am so fired up. You get, you get to hear an amazing story from a former student who actually went to Big Stuff, who's, whose life has been impacted by South Point. So what, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to give your attention to the screens. We're going to bring the lights all the way down um, and take a view at this amazing story. So from what I remember from my childhood, we were a semi-Christian family. We went to Nazarene Church right by our house. We went kind of every other Sunday. We 
said grace before dinner, but far as I know, I never really truly knew like Jesus or God, what it truly meant to be a Christian. My parents were married, but we're always together. It was me and my half-blood sister. We all lived in my grandfather's house for the longest time. When my parents finally broke up, it was over. Um, my mom wanted to get married and have some entitlement in the relationship in the house and all that. But my dad either wasn't really ready or just didn't really want that and that really tore the family up a lot. My dad believed that since my mother left and she ruined a happily good family that she did not deserve any part of me. Uh, at the moment of when I was in eighth grade, I I believed him with all the anger inside of me that she did not deserve anything to do with me since she ruined a happily good family. So that isolation from my mother roughly stayed for about my eighth grade year to my sophomore year where I would not have any part of her and if there needed anything to be said that my dad would handle it. My best friend Gabe Kaiser, he told me about South Point and he offered it to me and my dad and well, me and my dad were in a place where we kind of needed to go since we both were in a slump and in a dark place. So we were taken up to offer. And me personally, I really enjoyed my first time going to middle school ministry. It seemed like they actually cared about the students and wanted the best for them, which is what I needed at the time. So when I first went to Big Stuff was that summer and we went down to Daytona Beach and for anyone that doesn't know what Big Stuff is, it's a huge Christian camp. I was nervous but kind of influenced to go and it was huge impact on my life. That's where I learned more and grew closer to Jesus than I ever had, ever. And that's where I finally noticed that the burdens and the struggles of my life can possibly be removed and possibly be gone in my life. I started to realize that I can't hold this burden or hold a grudge against my mom for something that she thought was right for herself. And I realized that my dad can't tell me to not love my mom. So I remember on multiple occasions I would try my very best to try to see my mom or just maybe talk to her and my dad would get so heated and it would just end in a horrible argument. I kept on being persistent, kept on fighting him, asking him just anything to do anything with my mom and he finally like gave in and was like why I turned 18 and started being more independent that I could see my mom freely whenever I wanted to no like consequences no chains nothing my senior year 2018 this spring I was baptized for my first time and I made that decision I wanted that to be my first independent adult decision to lead and open up my life. I remember uh, Miss Jen holding me and then dunking me under the water and just a rush of joy and 
pleasure just coming to me once I reversed from the water. It was an amazing point in my life that I will always remember. Now I can see my mom freely whenever I want and me and my dad are still very close and very happy with each other and he has no problem for me seeing my mom. We both go to church every Sunday and we love each other. Hey, can we give it up for my friend Dom? I don't know if you know how hard it is uh, for a student to tell a story that includes pain in front of a camera, knowing that everyone at church will see their story. Um, but here's some amazing news about my good friend Dom. Is, uh, Dom has graduated from high school last year, as you heard, he got baptized. Um, but here's the amazing thing about Dom is that he is continuing to take his next steps and he is now reaching backwards. He actually serves in our kids ministry and serves on the elementary team because he knows that his life is more than just consuming and he wants to give back. And so I'm so proud of him. And here's something I want to do at our Lusby campus. If you're watching on our YouTube channel or live, um, if we could stand, we're going to pray for my good friend Dom and then let him not be embarrassed up here on stage. So if you guys would pray with me, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for all that you do. We're grateful for Dom's life. We're grateful for the healing and the grace that you've brought into his life, God. Uh, God, we're grateful for the launching points of big stuff and baptism, God. But we believe the best is yet to come in his life, God. We believe that you're gonna launch his life in a direction that he could have never, ever imagined and that his best days are ahead of him. So God, we pray for continued healing in his family, God, continued direction. Thank you for the gift that he is. And we are so proud of the man that he is is becoming. We ask that you would keep him and protect him. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give it up for my friend. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but is anyone like fired up to be at church today? I mean, I don't know about you, but getting to be a part of a church that impacts eternity and changes the world is awesome. And it feels good. I mean, you look at those doors, you, you see the stories and you go, man, it feels good to be a part of something that is creating life change. But here's what I discovered about the feel good of the life change that we all love, that there's an uncomfortable truth that goes along with it. See, we all get really excited. We all love the doors up here. And we, we, we all love like the, the story of Dom, right? But, but, here's, but here's what we don't realize is, is that life change just doesn't happen. Matter of fact, we're gonna, we say it this way here, which is this, and we're gonna put it up on the screen. I promise you it's coming. Life change doesn't just happen. And it's not. Life change doesn't happen. Dom's story didn't, wasn't an accident that just happened. And it wasn't just free. Life change doesn't just happen, it's free. And so here's the truth that we realize about life change. Life change requires vision and resources. That's why at South Point, when you come, we say, we don't care where you've been. We don't care what you've done because we wanna see you through God's eyes. See, God says, when I step into your life, it doesn't matter where you've been, what's been done by you or to you. When you say yes to Jesus, it changes the direction and launches your life in a different way. And we have God vision here at South Point and it takes resources. I mean, we, we all love the doors and we love Dom's story, but I wanna tell you something. Did you know that big stuff wasn't free? I mean, we had to pay the camp. There's this camp fee that you have to pay to send students here. And the reason there's this a camp fee is, is well, because you know what? They have speakers there and they have a band there and they have all these leaders there and they do all these, these things and they provide resources. And you know what? They have families and they need to eat and they have bills too, so, so it's not free. And did you know that the hotel that the students stayed at, did you know that that wasn't free either? I mean, someone had bought that property, built that building, they had employees there and they needed to be paid and they need to eat food. And so that wasn't free. Did you know the buses that the kids took, the, you know, the, the the big 57 passenger uh, buses that they took. Did you know that wasn't free? I mean, someone had to buy the buses. The bus driver, he has a family. He needed to like have resources. So that wasn't free. Did you know that the food that they ate at the Big Stuff Conference, it wasn't free. Someone had to make it. Someone had to grow it. Someone had to serve it. It wasn't free. A matter of fact, the total cost to send a kid to Big Stuff was over $700 per kid. Did you know at South Point, we scholarshiped of the 59 kids or students that went, we scholarshiped over 15 of them. We gave some students full scholarships. We gave some students part scholarships or, you know, a little bit. 
But overall, South Point invested over $13,000 to send 59 students and 11 volunteers to Big Stuff. Yeah. When I did the numbers, it's 1% of our budget was invested in those 13 doors that you see behind you. And that doesn't include the staff hours and the events we ran to reach those kids and to invite those students there. Which leads us to the feel good. We love the feel good stories, but it leads us to this uncomfortable truth this morning. And, and here's the uncomfortable truth. Creating life change that impacts eternity comes with a? Creating change in the life of my friend Dom. 13 students who said yes to Jesus and he tells us that they've crossed from, from death to life came at a cost. Now, this is the part in the message where I need to give you a confession. I need to confess that I have failed. And you might be asking, well, what have you failed at, Pastor Matt? I think I have failed to communicate this in a compelling and clear manner on a regular basis. And the reason I haven't done this in a compelling and clear manner is because if we are really honest, churches, everyone nod your head, have abused this, right? Churches have abused the conversation of money. Everyone nod their head. We all know that that's true, right? Matter of fact, for some people, it's why you left church. And in an effort to kind of like avoid all that, I've not shared a truth that is tied to what we love. We, what's tied to the feel good of impacting eternity and change lives is, is that it's not free, that it comes at a cost. And some of you might be going, Matt, you're probably being too hard on yourself and, and, and I wanna go thank you for your grace, but I have some stats to share with you. And they're not about other churches, they're about South Point, both our Lesbian and our Leonardtown and kind of our online community. I have some stats to share with you about giving. And listen, it's not to guilt you or shame you, this is about my failure. I mean, when I saw this thing, I said, I've, I've, I gotta get better and it's this. Did you know that 70% of adults who attended in the last 12 months gave? Oh, oh, come on, man, like we can all read that, right? Well, let's try that one more time. 70% of the adults who attended the last 12 months gave? Zero. Dollars. Now I get it. Did you know that every week about 20% of our audience has no faith or different faith? They come walking through the doors, giving Jesus and God and church one last chance. But the rest of us who say that we love Jesus and we're followers, I mean, 70%. And then here's another statistic. When I saw, I said, I have, I've done a board, I failed. Here's the other, 99% of South Point's budget is given by 20% of the donors. 99% is covered by 20% of the givers. Obviously, I have failed. Obviously, I've done a poor job of communicating a truth that life changed, that impacts eternity and changes the world and empties hell and fills heaven requires resources, financial resources. And so I'm gonna to apologize to our Lusby campus, to our Leonardtown campus, and to those watching online. And I am sorry and I'm committing to do better. But here's a truth that we all need to acknowledge. That the local church, listen, the local church is not funded by some outside organization. There's no outside organization going, man, we love St. Mary's County so much. We're just going to just going to pay for everything so you can know Jesus. There's there's no outside organization. Did you know the local church is not funded by some business out there looking for a tax break? And some of you think, well, maybe the local church is funded by God's miraculous thing. Maybe some of you think God's going to take a tornado and get one of those armored trucks and all the money's going to come out of the armored truck and somehow that tornado will end up right over South Point Church and just drop all that money right on us. I got to laugh the first service. You guys, hey, we're not going to take five offerings. There's no guilt, and no shame. This is my failure. But at some point, we have to admit the truth that the local church is funded and resourced by the local people who are a part of that church. And here's why it's important. Because when you read the news, and you watch TV, and you go out into your communities, you look at Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and you see the brokenness of the world. Did you know the church stewards the hope of the world? We don't steward religion. We don't steward ritual. We don't steward politics. We steward a person who overcame hell and death so that people could experience life and life to the full. So I'm sorry and I commit to doing better. Now here's, here, here's, here's the kind of the funny thing. 
is that the very gospel, the very thing that you and I said yes to, that life change comes at a cost, is at the core of the gospel. It's at the core of what you and I said yes to. I mean, it's my number one observation is this, is that, listen, Jesus set the example of paying the price for life change. Matter of fact, Jesus in his own words describes this. I mean, this is the core of what you and I believe. Jesus set the example of paying the price for life change. Matter of fact, Jesus' own words recorded in the gospel of Mark. Mark 10, 45, these are the words of Jesus. So if you get offended, don't get offended at me. Just take it up with Jesus. Here's what Jesus says. For even the son of man did not come to be. Now I just want to say something. I wonder how many of us show up to church hoping to be served. But if we're followers of Jesus, then our goal is not to get served, but to be servants. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to, and to give his life as a ransom. He gave his life away. At the heart of what we do every Sunday, at the heart and the core of our message is that there's a God who made us and a God who loves us. But at some point, all of us, no matter how good you are, no matter where you're at in life, at some point, all of us have done this. We've all stiff-armed God. And we've all made a decision we knew was wrong, yet we chose to do it anyway. The word for that is sin. I've done it, you've done it, we've all done it. There are no innocent people. We've all fallen short. And that gap between a perfect and holy God and us, we can't pay the gap. There's a debt that you and I owe God that we can't pay. But Jesus paid it. Y'all would be fired up this morning. Jesus willingly went to a cross. Jesus willingly spilt his blood and he paid our debt, my debt, your debt, our debt, so that we could be adopted back into the family of God as sons and daughters. Jesus set the example of paying the price. At the core of what you and I believe is that we couldn't earn it and we don't deserve it. Which leads me directly into observation number two. And if you only take one thing away, you should take this away. And it's this. Free is always paid by someone. Right? Free is always paid by someone. There's nothing ever truly free. It just means someone paid for it. And this is at the heart of the gospel. That we could not give God what we owed him, but Jesus paid it for us. And here's the most amazing news. Grace is free. We get to show up here and go, listen, it doesn't matter where I've been and what I've done, I am forgiven and I can be free because Jesus paid my price. Grace is free to you and I, but it costs God his only son. And I think sometimes we forget that our forgiveness was bought with the blood of Jesus. Matter of fact, even the first followers of Jesus understood this concept. And this isn't my idea that free is always paid for. We see this is what the disciples did. All those that followed Jesus continued to do what Jesus did. They continued to serve and they continued to ransom their lives away so other people could experience Jesus free of cost. Matter of fact, we pick it up in the Gospel of Luke. The eyewitness account says, after this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up everything and got up and left everything and followed him. Now I want to stop right there. Listen, Jesus called this guy Levi, who was a tax collector. But tax collectors were traitors and they were thieves. He wasn't an IRS man. He wasn't a good person. He was a traitor to his country and he made his income by stealing from his own people. He was a traitor and a thief. And the only reason that Jesus could call a traitor and a thief to come follow him was because Jesus was gonna pay his price on the cross for him. And then it says, Levi left at everything. And here's what happens when we follow Jesus, we surrender. Now that's a sermon for another day, but that one was free. Okay, <laughs> going on. Then Levi held a... Oh, come on. Had a great banquet. <laughs> then Levi, what? Held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. So here's what Levi does. Jesus calls Levi to follow him. And what is one of the first things that Levi does? Levi throws a great banquet. I mean, he throws out a spread. He throws out, you know, all that they can drink. And then just so you know, you know, for all you tea toddlers, like it was wine back in those days, right? Like it was, you know, stuff of the grape. And so, you know, they had wine, they had food, they had cheese, like all kinds of food. Levi threw a great banquet for his friends. Now I just wanna ask a question. Who do you think paid for that banquet? Oh, it's not a trick question, people. It was Levi. 
Like Jesus didn't like say, hey, magical, magical elves make Krabbler, you know, Keebler crackers and cheese. Like he doesn't say he did a miracle of the wine. Matter of fact, who paid for this? Levi, at his own expense, used what he had been blessed with to bless others. Imagine if the church could get a hold of that. That all of our blessings aren't just for us. It's so that we can bless the world around us. It goes on to say this. But the Pharisees and the teachers, just put church folk. Ain't it funny the people that get upset were church folk? But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to the sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors? And why are you hanging out with the traitors and the thieves? And the, why are you hanging out with them? Why are you spending money? Why are you having a great banquet? Look what Jesus says. Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And here's what Levi did. Levi took some of his own stuff and he paid for the food and the drink to create space and opportunity for those who needed to see Jesus to see him. You can see, because even in the Bible, we see that free is always paid by. You know, here at South Point, every time we do announcements, we take offering, we make this statement. We say, listen, if you're new to South Point or not a follower of Jesus, we don't want something from you. We want something for you. Please don't give in the offering. But just so you know, we're not really talking to everyone who calls South Point in their home. We're not saying that to you. It's for the new people. It's for the people who aren't in yet. It's for the people who are still discovering whether it is they want to follow Jesus or not. But they get that free. They get to experience all this freely because someone else. And it's the responsibility and the privilege of those of us who name the name of Jesus. Which leads me directly into, into, into observation number three, which is this. Followers of Jesus give back to God out of not Followers of Jesus give back to God out of love, not guilt. Like, see, man, like, think about this. When you and I understand grace, when you and I absolutely understand what grace is, we will always be generous. Listen, listen. When you understand that grace will buy you an inheritance in heaven that you couldn't imagine. When you understand, no matter kind of your family background, if you grew up in a church home and you made straight A's and you did this and you did that, that you still didn't earn your way to heaven. When you understand grace is that you and I were eternally separated from God and we were going to spend eternity in hell and God sent his son and he paid a price that we couldn't pay out of love. He gave up heaven's best. When you and I fully understand grace, something happens in our heart. And when it comes to giving back to God, we don't do it like, oh, I have to. Oh, woe is me. Oh, I just want to get. Like, if you really understand grace, you don't want to do that. You are fired up and excited about it. I mean, listen. The scripture tells us, listen, there's this guy, his name was Saul. And he actually became this guy named the Apostle Paul. And see, for many people who are critical of the New Testament, I always go, man, you have a real problem with Paul because in history outside the Bible, there's this guy named Saul. He persecuted the church. This was after Jesus was dead and resurrected. Yet this guy who persecuted, persecuted the church named Saul became a guy named Paul because he encountered a risen Jesus. Listen, you and I can disagree with the tomb means that it's empty, but it's empty historically. And this Paul goes around and he plants church. And there was a church in Corinth that's a lot like this church. It had people who had no faith background. It, was, it, had, it had people who had come from different backgrounds. It had some Jewish people who grew up in church. And it was in a port city. It was kind of wild and crazy. So it's a lot of church like this, very diverse and kind of crazy. Here's what the apostle Paul writes. He says this, he says, each of you should give what you've decided out of your, not out of guilt, not because the pastor told you, not out of shame, but out of your, to give, not reluctantly, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Because when you understand grace, that everything that you, think about this. How did you get born wherever you were to have whatever it is that you have? How were you born in the family? How were you born with the talents and the abilities you have? How are you born with the chance and the opportunities to get where you are? They are all free gifts from God. And so we cheerfully give back. And then he doesn't end there. In verse 13, here's what he says. He says, because of the service, what service? That you were generous, that you gave so that the mission of God could happen here on earth so that we could bring up there, down here. That doesn't just happen by itself. It happens because people have vision and resources. Because of the service by which you have provided yourselves, others will what? When you and I pay, 
and give and serve. People like Dom will give thanks to God for the change that has happened in his life. When those students who crossed from death to life because it was a church that had staff people that were paid for and paid for their trip, they're gonna thank God. And then it says for the obedience. Now, remember I said, I don't do very good at this stuff. Like I get all nervous and worried that you just, you know, think I want money, but I, I need to be better at obedience. I need to be better. And I told you, I'd tell you the truth. So you just need to ching, ching, bing, buckle up. See, here's the thing why Paul uses obedience because God tells his followers from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. So I want everyone to look up here. God tells his followers, not non-followers, not businesses. God tells his followers that all that you have really belongs to him. And that God wants you to keep most of what you have, but that you should give in proportion to what you do have, not what you don't have, but you should take about 10%. I'm not going to argue with you about the percentage. We can do that on a different day. But God says you should take about 10% and give it back to his mission, which means you get to keep about 90% of what you have to save and to spend, right? And he says that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. Now, anytime I talk about giving up to 10%, people always go, well, uh, you know, and I, so again, this is gonna be a little bit of a tough part. So this is like, just, I might offend you and you may never come back, but I, I just have to be honest. I don't wanna take a survey. So if you're in Lusby, could you take this with us? If you're watching online, take it with us. If, I need everyone to participate, even if you hate me and are gonna throw stuff at me later, that is okay. But if we could just all participate. Okay, so here's the participation. Okay, so if you have gone out to a restaurant where you had a waiter or waitress serve you in the last 90 days, I want you to raise your hand. Go ahead, raise your hand. If you've gone out to a restaurant and some of you are lying because I've been out in Southern Maryland, people eat out all the time, right? I would, I would bet that 99% of us have been to a place where we had a waiter or waitress service in the last 90 days. Okay, now I want, we're gonna do a raise your hand hands again at Lusby online everywhere, right? Okay. If you left your waiter or waitress a tip of 15, 18, or 20%, I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question. Why is it okay for you and I to leave a waiter or waitress a 15, 18, or 20% tip for serving our food, but we're offended when someone says we should give 10% back to the God who saved us with the blood of his son. I told you I was gonna tell you the truth. And I wanna admit something right now. I would never ask you to do something that I don't do. Now I'm not bragging, but I just want there to be great clarity here. My wife and I are not in the ten, top 10 earn wagers at South Point but my wife and I are in the top 10 givers at South Point Church. I love giving back to God. Everything I have comes, I get to spend eternity with him. Out of a joyful and cheerful heart, we should give to the God who gave us everything. And you and I are called to do more than just consume our ways to happiness. When we say yes to Jesus, we join his mission. And if I had to sum it all up, I'd say it like this. If you're following along the insert, it's going to be up here on the screen. The churches, not just South Point, but every church, whether you come here or go somewhere else, this is the truth. The church's ability to create impact is directly connected to the amount of that are given. Listen, only God can change hearts. Only the Holy Spirit can do what the Holy Spirit can do. Listen, you and I can't change human hearts, but God will always use people. God will always use the resources to create space and influence and opportunities for people to do the ministry. People always go, we should do more. And I go, yes, you know what we need to do more? We need more. Oh, come on, man. I'm not gonna like, it's just true. People always say, how much ministry can you do? I go, as much money as we have. Like it, our ability to have impact comes from the resources that we have. Volunteer resources, financial resources. And we're not doing it so that I can ride in a yacht or we can have a gold a mansion church. It's for what those doors represent right behind me. And as we continue to take our next steps to overcome the obstacles that are keeping us from reaching more people, I wanna put something up on the screen. I wanna ask you to do this inside. If you didn't get one of these, but I hope that everyone have got one of these when you came in. Uh, the usher should have given it. If you didn't get one, uh, please raise your hand. It's a generosity guide. 
about partnering with us as we take the next steps. And here's what I wanna ask. Listen, this generosity guide is not about guilt. It's not about shame. It's about a spiritual journey. Where are you at in giving back to God? And where does God want you to be? And in here it says, listen, you can pray. It gives you some idea of how we're gonna raise the funds necessarily to build our building. And it talks about maybe some giving revenues you haven't thought to and what a pledge would look like. And so listen, if you're here and you're not married, I would really encourage you to like, just look over this, pray and seek what God is. This is a spiritual response, not a complaint impulsive, like guilt you deal. And if you're married, please make time to sit down and talk to your spouse and go over this generosity guide. Now, I need everyone to do this with me, even if you hate me, even if you're never coming back. Um, I, there's a commitment card. Now, so I need everyone to grab it. Everyone grab it, kind of shake it like this because I'm hot up here. So if you could shake it, it would fan me. Please, everyone. I need everyone to come on, let's be online. Like, and if you're online, you can just look at this one with shake. Okay. Now here, I want you to notice, did you notice what didn't happen? This thing did not go into your wallet and take your money. Do you notice that when you touch this card, it didn't take your credit card information. No money came out of your account or your wallet when you touch the commitment card. People often ask me, Pastor Matt, why do we need a commitment card as we begin to take our next steps? And I say, it's so the church can take wise financial decisions. They go, well, the spirit will move. And I go, yeah, the spirit can move ahead of time as same in the moment. And so we believe God's presence moves in preparation as in the moment. So this allows us to know from the local church what resources we have to spend. And so if you would just take a look at that, and then here's what's gonna happen. On November 4th, we're gonna ask two things of you. First, we're gonna ask for what is called a Kickstart offering. And a project of this scale are $5.2 million to, to do the building. Um, we, have, we don't have enough resources in our general operating budget to kick off a project like this for architectural fees and permitting fees and all those things like that. Um, so we're asking, would you kind of make a one-time gift? And the goal would be like, look at your three-year pledge. I'm gonna give above and beyond the general operating. I'm not gonna take from the operating. I'm gonna give above and beyond my regular giving to support this new building. And then maybe you would say this three-year pledge, I'm gonna take a percentage of that, maybe 10%, like a down payment on a house or a down payment on a car. And you don't have to, but would you consider making a one-time gift on November, what day? November 4th, a Kickstarter offering. And then in December, and we're gonna take those on the 4th, but we're gonna take your pledges on November 4th. Would you consider that you and your family would sacrificially give above and beyond to help us have our building that will launch lasting life change. And what we've discovered is if you give monthly, people can give over a three-year period what they can't give in a one time. Now, we've talked about all the uncomfortable things. Okay, so now we get to talk about the feel good. Everyone smile, it's good, we're done, we're done. We're, we're done with the uncomfortable, everyone's like, it's okay, smile, smile at your neighbor, it's okay, it's good, right? Now we're gonna talk about the feel good part. See, I don't know if you know this, but here at South Point, we don't believe in the next generation. We believe the next generation is the now generation. I don't know about you, but I grew up hating church. You sat in hard wooden pews. They yelled at you. They smacked your hand. You didn't understand anything what they were doing. And we don't want our kids or our students to grow up in that kind of environment. We want our kids and our children, our students to come to a church that they love, where they hear there's a God who made them, a God who loves them, and a God who wants to be friend. Did you know that every Sunday between our two campuses that there's over 220 18 and under high school, middle school, and students at our South Point campuses. Did you know that 220, 18 and under is larger than the average church in America? And you may or may not know this, but twice a year we do something at South Point at both of our campuses where we offer our students and our kids, age appropriate of course, up to a certain age, um, we offer the kids and the students a chance to respond and say yes to Jesus. So last Sunday, when I was up here talking about the church is a mission, a rescue mission, did you know that 10 kids and two students said yes to Jesus? And we could add another 12 doors up here just this last Sunday. Yeah, we should, that's awesome. 10 kids, two students just last Sunday. Everyone wants to be a part of a church that impacts eternity and changes the world. At South Point, our number five value is we're contributors, not consumers. So I wanna leave us with this question. Where are we on our journey of giving back? And where does God want us to be? Because if we follow the example of Jesus, that means it's free for someone else, but someone paid for it. May you and I love our community enough to pay whatever price so that they can see the God who loves them and died for them in a person named Jesus. Let me pray. Hey God. I am always amazed that you would send your son and you would pay a price for a knucklehead like me. That when we couldn't earn it and we couldn't deserve it, when we were your foe, you fought for us. 
And you sent your son to die, to pay a price we couldn't pay. And Jesus, you asked those of us that follow you to follow your example, that we'd give our lives away so that other people could find life in this person named Jesus. God, as we continue to take our next steps, God, may we never be moved by guilt or compulsion, but may our hearts be moved by the God who loves us. We thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.